Morning, church. Uh, Today's scripture reading is Luke chapter 1, um, verses 39 to 56, and I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. Mary's visit to Elizabeth. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you, woman, blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. I'm excited to open up God's Word with you today. Our teaching text is the first of four songs in Luke chapters 1 and 2, and it's called the Magnificat, which comes from the Latin word magnify. After this song in uh, in Luke Luke chapters 1 and 2, we also get Zechariah's song, it's called Benedictus. We also get the angel's song, which is called Gloria, and then we also see the song of Simeon. And in between all of these songs, we see Anna also praising God, and we see the shepherds also praise God. Lots of praise happening in the first two chapters of Luke. Why? Because what God has done must be sung. Here's an interesting fact. If you cut these songs out of Luke, you actually lose none of the narrative of Luke. So why add the songs if it doesn't add to the narrative? Well, Luke shows us how to respond to the coming of Jesus Christ. You respond to the coming of Jesus Christ with praise and with adoration and with love and with worship. Let me put it to you. Luke is busy sharing with us the secret to joy in life. The secret to joy in life is to magnify God, to make much of Him, to be satisfied with Him and in Him, to live a life in which you proclaim with your head, your heart, and your whole being that God is enough. And that's enough reason for me to have joy and to have praise on my lips. This secret to joy in life is very different from what we see in our culture. You don't see this on billboards. You don't see this on advertisements. Well, there are some billboards next to the N1 that's got some scriptures on them, which I really do enjoy seeing. But mostly, you'll find products and ways and philosophies through which people say, this is the secret to joy in life. And Luke says, no, 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 no. The secret to joy in life lies in your magnifying of God and in the joy you find in Him. That's the essence, brothers and sisters, of the Christmas spirit. Are you feeling it yet? Think about a birthday party. Which birthday parties are you most excited about? You are most excited about the birthday parties of people you know well. You're not as excited about a birthday party of someone you don't actually know that well. So the key to getting into the Christmas spirit 
and being really excited to celebrate Jesus' birthday, saying that in inverted commas, is actually when you know Him and you are excited about Him and you are excited about celebrating His birth. So just a quick check. How are you this morning? Are you in the Christmas spirit? Are you excited about Christmas for the reason of knowing Jesus and celebrating His birth and what He's done? Or does your excitement lie in other things? Or do you have a lack of excitement because you have a lack of knowledge and intimacy of Jesus and therefore you are just not that excited about His birthday party? I think it's just a, a, a good moment to just sit and reflect on what's going on inside of you. We'll tackle our teaching text with three points. And we will spend the longest time on the third point, because the third point is studying Mary's song of praise. So three points and three sub-points. Let me show it to you, then it will make sense. So we'll see the need for fellowship. We'll see the joy of redemption. And then we'll see the song of worship. And then we're going to spend a lot of time on the song of worship, looking at God's grace, God's ways, and God's promises. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we are excited about Christmas because we are excited about you. And we got together this morning to magnify you, to make much of you, and to experience joy because you came to us, and therefore we can know you, and therefore we can experience the joy of redemption, and therefore our uh, mouths were filled with praise earlier, Lord Jesus. I pray now as we open up the word that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, that you would lift us up, that you would encourage us, that you would edify us, that you would correct us, that you would rebuke us, that you would give us a clear understanding of this portion of Scripture and also a new and encouraging revelation of this portion of Scripture this morning. Mary had many reasons to praise. We also have many reasons to praise. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open up those reasons in our hearts and in our minds. Give us focus. Help us leave the year behind. Help us leave the next week where it is, and that's in the future. And help us to be present now and to be teachable by your Spirit. Anoint my lips. Let me only speak words that is accept acceptable unto you. I pray that in your name. Amen. Let's look at verses 39 to 40. The need for fellowship. So Mary covered between 120 to 160 kilometers to be with Elizabeth. Mary had to sacrifice for worship, Ach, for fellowship, I mean, but it was worth it because as we read this portion of scripture, we see that doing this 120 to 160 Ks was well worth it. Now, what's going on here? Uh, I'll keep the highlights on there for you for now. Elizabeth is six months pregnant after being old, and also being unable to have children. Mary just conceived, right? So Elizabeth has a six-month head start on her. Imagine this conversation. An old lady who is now pregnant with a young lady who is now pregnant. Both saw angels. Both got pregnant by a miracle. Just imagine the conversation. There's an urgency for fellowship in this portion of Scripture. Because during fellowship, we find comfort and we are encouraged. Look at the words that's highlighted in verse 39. Mary set out and she hurried. She had a need to be with someone who she could talk to. Because who else could Mary talk to? Imagine how she must have felt in her own hometown. Mary couldn't tell people that she was pregnant. Because she wasn't married yet. I mean, how does that conversation work with your parents? Like, how do you time that one? Before dinner, after dinner, in the morning, after tea time. Because what Mary said was the truth, but culturally, she would have been in big trouble. She would have been ostracized, and she would have brought shame over her family. So there's an urgency with Mary to be with someone who she can talk to, where she can find comfort, and where she can find some encouragement. She could say to Elizabeth, do you feel me? And Elizabeth could say to her, oh, 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 I feel you. I feel you. Because I also carry a miracle in my womb. 
Both of these ladies were divinely blessed. Both of these ladies saw angels. And both of these ladies still needed to see each other. This is really, really important for me that we get this out of this portion of Scripture. Our need for fellowship is not a sign of weakness in our lives. We don't need people because we're weak. We need people because we were designed for fellowship. And these ladies could have said that we are really brilliant servants of Yahweh because He appeared to us in all of these different ways. But they didn't. They show their maturity in their urgency and their need for fellowship. Why? Because when we have fellowship, we stir up one another. And this is exactly what they did. That's why I said earlier, just imagine the conversation and the excitement about a child leaping in a womb and a Savior that will be born in nine months' time. This is a great reminder for us here today. Even though you might have had phenomenal experiences of God, and you maybe have them now, you still need fellowship. We often say in this church that you need to be known and you also need to know other people. And that takes us into a great depth of growth and spiritual maturity, not weakness. So let us not make the mistake to only say that we need people when we are down and out. We also need people when we feel like we are maturing and growing in faith. The need for fellowship. Let's look at verses 41 to 45, which is about the joy of of redemption. Okay, so summarizing those verses, here's what happened. Elizabeth said, yes, come on, great news. This is absolutely phenomenal news. I'll get a second chance. He'll get a second chance. The whole world will get a second chance. The whole creation will get a second chance. This is what we waited for. Remember, her joy because of the redemption that is announced to her, comes from the rest of the story of the Bible up until this point. God has promised, I'll get to that later, back in the day that someone will crush the head of the serpent and will fix everything that is broken in this world, and now this child is coming, and that's the news that Elizabeth is excited about. How could she not respond like this? They have been waiting. They've gone through a 400-year period of silence as the people of God for something to happen. Can you wait 400 years? We can't. I mean, as adults, we could probably wait days and months and years. Kids can't wait for five seconds. <laughs> and they had to wait for 400 years. Boom! And here's the news. She doesn't have jealousy. She's got joy. She doesn't have bitterness. She's happy. I can imagine if you would put this in a real housewives of Nazareth, Elizabeth would have said, Oh, you're so lucky that you can give birth to Jesus. I only have John. But there's none of that. I have never watched an episode of any real housewives of any city. Just saying. But I've seen the trailers. I'm kind of working with it. Do you know what I mean? There's humility. There's awe, there's wonder at what is happening here. And she gives an early expression of the Lordship of Christ. Do you guys see it? She was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then she said, The mother of my Lord. There we go. This is who Jesus is. Is this how you and I respond to the good news? Because this is what we are waiting for, in Advent. Advent time is a time before Christmas in which we wait in expectation for the arrival and then we ponder and experience this expectation that the people of God also had before Jesus was actually born. And when she hears the good news and when she knows what's coming, joy bubbles out in many different ways. And I think we need to pause and reflect on this and ask ourselves, how are we doing today? Are we excited and joyful about what is to come? 
If I say to you, great news, the Savior is born, and this is your opportunity for redemption, even though you might have experienced it already, is it something that bubbles out in many different ways? Or are we so disconnected with this narrative and this time of year because we're tired, and we've got end-of-year blues, and we feel either dissatisfied or disappointed or discouraged about whatever happened in our year? This is great news, the joy of redemption. And if you believe this, it will rejuvenate your soul. You get a second chance again and again and again and again. And every single person on this earth can get a second chance. Even the earth gets a second chance for it will also be made new. The joy of redemption that comes through Jesus lifts us up. And we'll see this as we study this song. Third point. Let's look at the song of worship. So this is all the way through 46 to 55, and it'll be on two slides. So, Rudolf, if you can just navigate with me as I point to specific verses, please. Mary probably composed this on the road to Elizabeth. Walking for 120 k's, 160 k's, will take you a long time. And on this journey, we don't actually know who Mary made this journey with, but on this journey, Mary probably, this is an educated guess, a guesstimate. She pondered everything that she knew. She pondered everything that she had experienced. And Mary was reflecting on the Scriptures, which she knew very well. We'll see that in just a few minutes. This is what N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar, says about this song. You can read it with me. He says, It's the gospel before the gospel. A fierce, bright shout of triumph 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. It goes with a swing and a clap and a stamp. It's all about God, and it's all about revolution, and it's all because of Jesus. Jesus, who's only just been conceived, not yet born, but who has made Mary giddy with excitement and hope and triumph. In many cultures today, this is N.T. right, it's the women who really know how to celebrate, to sing and dance with their bodies and voices, saying far, things far deeper than words. And that's how Mary's song comes across here. A young lady experiencing grace and expressing praise. Beautiful, isn't it? Now look at it closely. Mary's worship is wholehearted. She's worshiping with all that she is. She mentions her soul. She mentions her spirit. And soul and spirit includes mind and strength. She puts everything into this praise. Question, what would make you celebrate? from the depths of your being without inhibition. Like, what could I tell you today in your own life that would make you go, yes, come on, I've waited for this news for so long. Is it physical healing? Is it your debt being erased? Is it a relationship being repaired? Is it someone uh, reconciling with you? Like, how would you respond to such magnificent news. Would you call some folks? Would you dance? Would you shout? Would you write a song? Would you weep for joy? Whatever your uh, expression might be, we can understand how Mary just broke out in praise. You would also have seen, I've done my yes shout twice now. I'm a sports guy, so that's all I really have. Like, that's my best expression of praise. Make first, get down, and shout. But that's just (coughs) how I would have done it. Her worship is wholehearted. Her worship is personal. Do you guys see? My Savior. She's not talking about a Savior. She's talking about my Savior. Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Can you say, my Savior, do you know Him? And Mary, his own mom, needed a Savior just like the rest of us. And that's really, really important for us to note. 
So Christmas is historical. Christmas is theological. It teaches us so much of God. But it is intensely personal. It's for each and every one of us. So her worship is wholehearted, her worship is personal, her worship is also directed toward God. Do you guys see that? Magnifies the Lord. My soul praises the greatness of the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then we see she talks about the Mighty One. She talks about the Holy One. She talks about what He has done. So her worship is directed towards Him. Life is about magnifying God, and in doing so, you will maximize your joy. I said it in the beginning. Guys, let's just pause for a second here and say to each other that Mary had a lot going on. Mary was under a lot of pressure. Mary was going to give birth to the Savior of the world in just nine months' time, and there was a lot of things that she had to navigate. So what does she do? She ponders and reflects on the nature of God, the character of God, the actions of God. And that was her cure for stress and anxiety. That's what made her joyful. It's the same for us. When we struggle with stress and anxiety, God's nature, His character, and His actions should be the very cure for our own anxiety. Okay, now, so that's the song taken as a whole. Where do all these verses come from? Well, it's simple. Mary knew her Bible. She knew her Bible very, very well. I read some commentaries in which some scholars say that they actually don't think that Mary composed this song because it's just too brilliant for a 12-year-old girl, year girl to think of and to write. I do believe that she wrote it. I do. In the beginning of Luke, Luke says, I verified everything that I wrote to you. Okay, so Luke won't lie and just kind of float this in here and attribute this to Mary. Mary had learned the scriptures while growing up. She learned the scriptures at home. She learned the scriptures in the synagogue. And if you look at the teachings of Jesus and you look at the teachings of his brother James, you'll see that they also got taught something by their own mom. So Mary is a really good example of passing on the teaching of the Old Testament from generation to generation. If you would dissect this song, check this, you will find allusions to the Old Testament and phrases in the Old Testament from the books of <gasps> Genesis, Deuteronomy, 1st and 2nd Samuel, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. That's someone who knows their Bible. And that's what she was pondering as she was going to Elizabeth. The most obvious allusion to this song is to Hannah's song, another woman who was unexpectedly expecting in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Just a quick glance at this little grid. Let me show you. So Hannah says, and Mary says, now, Mary didn't use Hannah's whole song, and Hannah's whole song wasn't taken up completely in Mary's song, and obviously Mary added some to her song, but just look at how she knew the Old Testament and reused it and repurposed those themes for her own song. It's cool, isn't it? Brilliant song, but written from a deep knowledge of the story of God and His people up until that point. She may have meditated on this song, Hannah's song, before penning this beautiful piece. She had to, because she used some of these lines. Being a young woman herself, Mary, she probably loved the stories in the Old Testament of women of faith, like Sarah, Deborah, Hannah, Ruth, and Abigail, just to mention a few. The Apostle Paul says... In Colossians 3, verses 16 to 17, let's uh, read this together. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 
Paul says we should do this, and today Mary is a really good example of how to do this. Mary filled her mind with the truth of God's Word, and then worship was the logical response. Worship, brothers and sisters, is a response to the revelation of God. And if your worship is stale, then I think it might be because you have not meditated on God's truth and you have not seen Him reveal Himself to you in whatever ways He reveals Himself to us through Scripture, nature, our own experience, our own thoughts, and through our church traditions. Okay, why praise God? Why all of this praise, this festival of praise? Let's get to the three sub-points. God's grace, God's ways, and God's promises. Let's look at God's grace, verses 46 to 49. Friends, Mary was a nobody from a nowhere place. And God Almighty visited her and lifted her into His sovereign grace. That's how God chose to do it, and that's grace. Do you guys realize that God didn't come to Mall of Africa? God didn't come to Nelson Mandela Square with everyone from the press seeing Him there. God didn't come rolling in in a black BMW with blue lights in a big parade so that everyone must make way for Him. God came through a teenage peasant girl in a obscure town and he was born with animals in a cave. It's a manger, but it's a cave. In the very thing they eat from. That's grace. And Mary says in verse 49, the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Think about this. He, the Holy One, the Transcendent One, the Creator and the Sustainer of all things, the One who was and is and is to come, the Lord of Lords, the Almighty, comes to us, to you, to her. That's grace. And that's a reason to praise Him. And that is why Mary praises Him. Because He has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. And he did amazing things for her. Let's look at God's ways. God lifts the humble. We see that in 46 to 53. And then we see God humbles the proud in 51 to 53. Okay? So if you just uh, keep an eye on the scripture here. So God lifts the humble. The church father, well, Augustinus, I don't actually know how you say that properly in English, Augustine or Augustine, if you want to. He said, for those who want to learn God's ways, humility is the first thing, the second thing, and the third thing. God is all about humbling himself and also lifting the humble. Look at this amazing scripture in Isaiah 57, 15. It says, for the high and exalted one, this is God, who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this, I live in two places. I live in a high and holy place, that's one of the places where I dwell, and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit. To do what? To revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the oppressed. What an amazing God, lifting the humble, the lowly, the oppressed, reviving them, spirit and heart, whole being. That's what God does. But God also humbles the proud. Look at verses 51 to 53. You'll see there's a great reversal. God takes the conventional standards of greatness and He turns them upside down. In verse 51, we see a reversal of attitude. In verse 52, we see a social reversal. And in verse 53, we see a spiritual or material reversal. Remember, this is what Mary praises God for. It's for what He did and what He does, His actions. Look at it, 51. He scatters the proud. 
There's a reversal of attitude because he lifts the humble, but he scatters the proud. Look at verse 52. He toppled the mighty and he exalted the lowly. There's a social reversal for you. And in verse 53, he satisfies the hungry and he sends the rich away empty. That is a way in which God humbles the proud is he turns around the very orders on which their pride is built. Do you guys see it? So my pride is built on my thoughts and my amazingness. I will scatter you. My pride is built because I am sitting on a throne. I will topple you. My pride is built because I've got money and I'm rich. I will send you away empty. Do you guys see how God humbles the proud? So he lifts the humble, and he humbles the proud. In John 6.35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He satisfies the hungry. Do you know what satisfies means? It means that you won't be hungry again. Real talk. Snacking versus eating. You cannot be full if you snack. You cannot. It's impossible. Like you keep on snacking either until it's all done or when you fall asleep with something in your mouth, but it'll never satisfy you. What satisfies you is a proper plate of food, well balanced. I'm not a dietitian, so well balanced in whatever that means in your life. And you chow the whole plate until you can say, Kikotsi, I am full now. That's me. That's satisfying. That's what it means. Mary says that's what God does to the hungry. And do you see what He satisfies them with? He satisfies them with good things. You will not lack. Question, if you feel so satisfied and all your needs were met, what's the next logical thing that you do? You say it to someone. You share it with someone. You tell someone how much you enjoyed this thing that you just had. You cannot keep it for yourself. It's the same with the good news. If you've experienced God satisfying you as hungry and lowly and oppressed, lifting you up, reviving you, and satisfying you with good things, you have to tell someone. That is our reason for evangelism. So if we don't evangelize, I think it's because we don't experience the satisfaction of relationship with God. But for His actions, He should be praised. So Mary praises Him for His grace and His ways. Last one, she praises Him for His promises. Mary looked back on God's covenant promise to Israel, stated in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Israel held to this promise through the ages. They put their hope in this promise through the ages. Israel wanted God to topple the bullies. Israel wanted God to topple the oppressors. Israel wanted God to send the Messiah. And then He came. And then the revolution followed. Jesus is the great offspring. And it is through Him that we are blessed. And we are Abraham's descendants through faith. So God kept His promises through Jesus, and we can now enjoy the fact that God kept His promises. Why does Mary go back all the way, if we can just have the last slide, please, Rudolf. Why does Mary go back all the way to the Old Testament? Well, because she knows that the birth of Jesus is a continuation of God's faithfulness. I just said it began with Abraham in terms of God's covenant and His promise, but it, it's actually visible from the beginning of the Bible story. In Genesis 3 verse 15, it says, Someone will crush the enemy's head. In Galatians 4 verse 4, Paul says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. This is Him. In Isaiah 7 verse 14, it says, A young virgin, uh, a young virgin who will give birth to this Son. It speaks about this young virgin. They've been waiting for this through the whole biblical narrative. Question, where is the son and who is this woman? And then the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary and says, you're the one. And through you I'm going to fulfill my promise. 
Luke chapter 2 verse 11, we'll get there next week, says, For you, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then it says in verse 13, Suddenly the heavenly host praised God. God keeps His promises. God creates a covenant with His people and He never breaks them. And the coming of Jesus and us putting our faith into Jesus gives us new life, it revives us, it lifts us up, it saves us, it justifies us. We should know this. That's what we're waiting on. This great salvation. This baby put joy in Mary's heart and it put a song on her lips. And we should too rejoice in Christ. Not just in His conception, which we read of today, but also as we read the Gospels, in His life, in His death, in His resurrection, His ascension, and His return. Everything that describes the Gospel. Let me end with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. And then Meryl will lead us in a response song. Here's what Spurgeon says. It's a beaut. He says, so then, to conclude, here is something for every child of God to do. You can all magnify the Lord, and you may all rejoice in Him. You cannot all preach. If you could, who would there be to hear you? If all were preachers, where would be the hearers? But you can all praise God. If there is any brother or sister here who has only one talent, let not such a one say, I cannot do anything. <laughs> you can magnify the Lord. To be happy in Him is to praise God. The mere fact of our being happy in the Lord makes music in His ears. If you are one of His children, you can be happy in Him. So get out of those doleful dumps, says Spurgeon. Cast out that spirit of murmuring and complaint which so often possesses you. Pray the Lord to help you shake off your natural tendency to look on the dark side of everything and say, No, no, I must not do that. After all, I am not on the road to hell. I am on the way to heaven. And this world is the waiting room to heaven. So my, my soul shall magnify the Lord and my spirit shall rejoice in God my Savior. What a finish. Like a spurgy chop. That's what we should do. Let us all magnify the Lord. We have reason to do so because of God's grace, because of God's ways, and because of God's promises.